of the church in Ephesus, right? Okay. So the messenger is the guy that's going to read this letter out loud to the congregation. See, in other words, this, this, this you know, was by the Apostle John. Um, one, one copy of this letter was sent to each of these seven congregations. So that's why in Revelation 1.3, he said, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it for times near. So you got the guy that's going to be reading, blessed is he who reads, and you have everybody else that hears. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear. So that's what the angels are. They're not like there's some angels standing over the congregation at Ephesus. It's the guy up front reading the message out loud. Make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, there's something called Occam's razor. How many of you have ever heard of Occam's razor? Yeah, it's not something you shave with. It, it just simply means the sa- simplest explanation is usually the best. Okay. <laughs> Which, you know, there's a lot of truth in that. So that's the simplest explanation. So, uh, Anybody want to comment on that? Anything else you want to say? Okay. Another question today? Yeah, Ken. I guess I'm looking for some uh, uh, opinion from you. Sometimes we have people in our backgrounds that we spend time with and we, we don't know how far to push things. We don't know how far to. We wonder their position in, in salvation. And I think you're understanding where I'm going with this. And, you know, you, you think, when do I move on? When do I, you know, how far do I keep pushing this? And sometimes it gets in to making relationships very strained. Yep. <clears throat> well, Ken's the only guy that's ever come up against this, so, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> that's a great question. Okay, you're, you're working with somebody, maybe relatives or close friends or, you know, who knows what their religious background is. Sometimes they're pretty close, Church of Christ maybe. Sometimes they're Baptist or Pentecostal. You know, sometimes they're atheist or, you know, <clears throat> liberal left-wingers, I mean, you got a whole range of people you're working on, and it's always a big challenge to know how you're going to get a uh, conversation going, and if you do get conversation going, like, like Ken's pointing out, okay, how far do you push it, because you hit a point where all of a sudden you're getting these, you know, body language signals that says, okay, we're not interested in hearing this anymore, and uh, <clears throat> so, you know, that's part of what you're up against, it's okay, how do you how do you know when to keep pushing and how do you know say okay back off and you know let her simmer for a while and the only answer I can give you let's go to Colossians chapter 4 Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6 it says conduct yourself with wisdom Colossians 4 verses 5 and 6 Conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you'll know how you should respond to each person. Well, wisdom, you've got to pray for it. See, so a lot of times, you, you know, you just, you know, James tells you when you pray for wisdom, believe you got the wisdom, make your decision and go. See, so that's what you've got to do. Because there's no, you know, there's no way any of us are going to have all the information we need about anybody else. Okay, when you realize that, you know, the human brain is running at least 72,000 thoughts per second, you know, the best they can, I mean, and I think it's a lot faster than that. You know, I think the stuff inside the human, you know, 12, 12 billion cells, 120 trillion connections, <clears throat> okay? And, you know, there's some indication that some of that stuff inside is like moving on optic fiber cables. Okay, so when you're trying to get a read on what somebody else is thinking, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous amount. But somebody does know, you know, what's going on. And, suddenly, and so that's why we can pray for wisdom. So you pray for wisdom, make a decision what you're going to do. Maybe you're going to let it sit. Maybe you're going to sit a little while. Maybe you're going to push it to the next point. And wisdom is what will tell you. And you've got to pray for that. And people are so variable you know, I mean, and then 
interaction, see? So depending on your relationship, sometimes you could push people more than the next guy could. Sometimes you can push people less than the next guy could. See, depending on those relationships, those things are so variable. So that's why I pray for wisdom. Anything else, Ken? Okay. Anybody want to comment on that? Okay, another question today. Yeah, Brian's got one. Uh, Romans 4, 9, is this blessing then on the circumcised or uncircumcised also for we say faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness? How then was it credited while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. So what do you say to people that try and say, well, you know, you don't need to be baptized because it was mm -hmm. credited before? Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> you know, that actually happened to me one time. I was working with... Uh, Tom Chandler, some of you guys remember Tom Chandler and, and uh, uh, Rich Bauman and a couple other guys, and they had been attending the, um, well, call, it came to be called New Life Center behind the old Safeway store uh, just off of Mendenhall, and uh, didn't have a pastor at that time, so naturally you got to go talk to a pastor, and the nearest pastor was Billings. So actually, Tim McHenry went with me that day, and I had well, maybe one other person. And so we went to Billings, and we met the uh, <clears throat> Assembly of God pastor. And so I went through the rabbit shooters, you know, just took them straight through. And <clears throat> now, see, these guys are smart. You know, <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of lazy preachers, but there aren't many dumb ones. <clears throat> they're, uh, they're very good at manipulation, you know, crowd manipulation. And um, knowing how to say things, and you know they're, you know they, and don't, they don't build those big churches because they're a bunch of dummies. And so this guy, he didn't even touch the rabbit shooters. See what he said was, okay. <clears throat> baptism came in the room of circumcision. See, and then he went right to that Romans four passage, where he said, see Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. Therefore, we're justified before we're baptized. See, and two out of the three guys I was working with went with him. See, I mean, that's, you know, that was, that was a good selling point. You know, good, good, got it. You know, that's, let's, let's just kind of review point. Let's go to Colossians 2 here. See, what is the connection between circumcision and immersion? That's. That's the request, you know. Um, <clears throat> in my God's Plan of Salvation book, I make a reference to, you know, uh, sometimes there's a tract there, what, and I put blank church, says about baptism. Well, what I took that from was the Dutch Reform. It says what, you know, what the Christian Reformed Church says about baptism. And, uh, you know, and my point is, it doesn't matter what any quote church says. What matters is what the Bible says. But see, there are other guys. There, another. Um, they, they believe that the <clears throat> physical circumcision was for the children of the covenant, okay? Which it was, and so they believe that baptism is for the children of the new covenant. You know, of course, they mean sprinkling by that. See, and so they're they're trying to make that connection was. Uh, you know, this is how, you know, baptism came in the room of, uh, of circumcision. But here in verse 11, he tells you, in him you were also circumcised a circumcision made without hands, the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in immersion, in which you're also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So the parallel between circumcision and immersion isn't, you know, that say they're children of the covenant or anything like that. The parallel is that the circumcision removed the foreskin of the baby boy. Immersion removes this body of flesh, you know, in a parallel spiritual operation to the removing the flesh of the baby boy. See, and, and so that's the parallel that's going to take place. Of course, we've talked about you know, there's what he calls here the body of the flesh, or some versions, body of the sins of the flesh, um, body of sin in Romans 6, the veil 
2 Corinthians chapter 3. That's that spiritual entity that drops in when a person commits their first sin that separates them from God. And that has to be removed in order for a person to have fellowship. So that's the parallel that the scripture is making. See, but then they make a black, black blanket statement, you know, okay, well, what circumcision was in the Old Testament, baptism is in the New Testament. That's an undefined statement. See, in undefined statements, then you can, <clears throat> you can use them any way you want. You know, it's like uh, <clears throat> rights, okay? You know, rights come from God according to the Declaration of Independence, inalienable rights, and the purpose of government is to protect those rights, okay? So rights are defined. Okay, right to life, right to liberty, right to property. Okay, those are defined. Now, as soon as you put the word civil <clears throat> in front of it, it makes it an undefined term. See, so that's last week, a couple officers, you know, connect with that Derek Chauvin thing in Minneapolis. A couple officers were uh, convicted on federal violating this guy that was killed, civil rights. See, you can, you know, as soon as you have an undefined term, you can, you can make that mean whatever you want. And, uh, or how about this one, justice. See, justice is defined. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, limb for social justice. What's that? Economic justice. Okay? So, same thing, circumcision. What, what circumcision was in the Old Testament, baptism is in the New Testament, what do you mean? See, it's undefined. See, you can make it mean anything you want to. And so, yep, therefore, Abraham was justified before he was circumcised. Therefore, we're justified before we're baptized. Done. But when you define it, as Colossians 2.11 does, okay, then you see the parallel. Well, there no since spiritual circumcision takes place in immersion, there's no way you're going to be a child of the covenant without the spiritual circumcision. And, uh, of course, babies or small children, they're not part of the covenant of it anyway. See? But, <clears throat> see, that's, again, the belief of the, the particularly the Reform Movement. You know, the Reform Movement was, ended up the Dutch Reform, like out at Amsterdam and Churchill and uh, Manhattan and Gallatin Gateway and Bozeman. And, and, uh, but you also have the, the conservative Presbyterians today would fit that, you know, a lot of Wesleyan. See, they're all... Think in terms of covenant. Now, when uh, uh, James Michener wrote a book on South Africa, you know, the kind of historical knowledge. How many read J any of James Michener's books? Okay, they give a lot of detailed history. You know, if you the, the older the history is, the more accurate it is. The more closer it gets to modern history, the more he takes a left wing turn on it. Okay, <clears throat> but uh, James Michener's book on South Africa was called Covenant. Anybody else read that besides me? Okay. And uh, the reason it's called covenant, of course, was the, the Portuguese were the first guys that uh, developed the spice trade with the Indies, you know, say north of Australia, today Indonesia. And uh, in uh, what's called the Battle of Malacca, Malacca Straits, uh, the Dutch defeated the Portuguese. Dutch Navy, and so now the East Indies became Dutch. In fact, you know, I'm old enough to remember when they were still called the Dutch East Indies, okay? So, for example, if you have a name Raggers, okay, that comes from Indonesia. It was transported to Netherlands, right? Well, if you look in Holland as well, it's Dutch. Yep, Holland, right? See? Because of those connections, all right. So that's where that name comes from. You know, anytime you see an E, you see an I J in the middle, that's that's Dutch, or you know, from Holland. Okay, like one of the spellings for Freddie Myers, the M E I J, right? How many have seen the M E I J on Myers? Okay, <clears throat> so it was the Dutch East Indies. Okay, they and they controlled it. They for a long time. What's well, a long ways from Holland or Netherlands to the East Indies? So they needed a stopping off point. So what they did is they developed Cape Town, <clears throat> South Africa. See, as they're kind of sailing around what's called the Cape of Good Hope. 
And so it was the, the Dutch people that settled South Africa, and they brought the, brought the reformed religion with them. And that's covenant. See, now these guys, you know, the Dutch went in more than a thousand miles. They went inland well more than a thousand miles before they ever encountered the blacks coming down. They were there first. Okay. So, you know, there's, I mean, and again, Michener, he, he documents that because that's history. See, so when they established South Africa, they had the idea that they were part, their children were part of the covenant. See, the, the covenant that God made with them. And so that's why that was important enough that that's, Michener put that as the title of the book. Okay. <clears throat> but it's a mis, misunderstanding of the relationship of what circumcision does in the Old Testament and what immersion does in the New Testament. You got to be sure that you let the script. There's all kinds of parallels you can make between, but you got to be sure before you get too definite about it. You got to be sure that you got the exact correlation that you got New Testament scripture supporting that. So, any further comments there, Brian? It's a good question, by the way. Anybody else want to comment on that? Mr. Luke Wilson? Just the very last thing you said, I think, is really important that we. There are analogies, but you have to stick to where the New Testament defines those and follow on through. There is an analogy of circumcision to immersion, as you brought up, but we need to stick with the part that the scripture makes, not, you don't get to just take that everywhere else. And I think there's, I'm noticing uh, in the evangelical world, this, you know, really fun of taking analogies and pushing them places that the scripture does not define. And I think we have to really be on guard in this culture that we don't get sucked into that. We got to stick with what, where this, what the scripture says, and only you know there is the old restoration movement saying, where the scriptures speak, we speak, where the scriptures are silent, we're silent. And I think we do need to be careful. We don't want to add to the word and be proved a liar. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. And uh, you know, I, I got a question the other day. It's a really good question, honest question, fair question. But I was wondering about. Um, Moses striking the rock twice, okay, when, when he, that cost him being able to go into the promised land, okay? And so what, the question is, what's the significance of the twice? <clears throat> well, I don't, I don't get to say because I don't have any, you know, I mean, I got opinions probably. I got opinions, <coughs> opinions about everything. You guys know that. But, uh, I don't. I, I can't say. Okay, this this is the significance of striking the rock twice because I don't have any other information on it. And there might be some area where I could make a case, you know, uh, which would have to be. But I but I don't have any. So it's just really important, you know, that we do stick to what the scripture does say because it's it's so easy. One of the things they were very, you know, when reading like the Millennial Harbinger. One of the things that they were concerned about was the fact that, you know, a lot of the guys coming in, you know, being immersed into Christ, uh, being a part of the restoration movement, new and exciting things going on. See, then all of a sudden they'd start taking all kinds of <coughs> particularly stuff out of the Old Testament and extending it <coughs> where beyond where they had New Testament authority. And it was creating a lot of problems for them. I'm glad I'm not. Okay, I'm back on high bat. Kind of remind me one time Paul Harvey was talking about it at O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And, uh, you know, this is when the terrorist stuff first started to kick up. And uh, so the lady flight attendant came into the, the, the cabin and she, she spoke to the, the captain. You know, she knew him, captain, the first officer, usually the captain was there. She knew him and she said, hi, Jack. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the airport was full of, <laughs> I mean, cars coming from everywhere, sirens, and, you know, and uh, so, you know, things do, so don't add to the scripture, okay? <laughs> uh, other, other questions today?
Yeah, K Caden. So I recently met a Jehovah's Witness. I was wondering uh, what are some basics uh, that I can kind of go to in just kind of day-to-day conversations with him. Um, because I know that he kind of brought it a bunch of different ways and I, they weren't really relevant to like the core issues. For example, like attending holidays, like the 4th of July. And he's a coworker, so I have a lot of opportunities. Okay, well no birthdays for you, buddy. <laughs> when you get older, you don't want any anyway. But that's a great question. Um, just a, a general thing first, and then we get into a specific for you, okay? You ever had the Jehovah's Witnesses? Not, how many had Jehovah's Witnesses knock at your doors? Okay, well, yeah, they're, you know, they're busy, you know. And uh, so they'll be happy to sell you a red book. You know, it's a, you know, it's kind of a thicker book, and uh, you know, on the front of it is this picture of, I mean porpoises frolicking in the sea and you know families you having nice picnics together and and it's you know everything's wonderful okay now that sets forth the core basic belief of the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Jehovah's Witnesses goal you know in their minds God's goal and Jehovah's goal is to get things back to like it was in the in the Garden of Eden to go back to the to the garden, and uh, so they, you know, so their their whole idea is is that God's really working, and there's of course going to be 144,000, um, you know, that are going to be in heaven, but all the other Jehovah's Witnesses, all 15 million of them or whatever, are going to be inheriting the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth, and so. That's why we kind of joke that the Jehovah's Witnesses set their fence posts in concrete because they're coming back. So you're going to, and they're going to, you know, they're, they're looking, they're looking their property over now uh, everywhere to see what they, what they're going to get when, when we get back. And it's going to be, like I say, like Eden, um, it's going to be a state of innocence. Nobody's going to commit any sin and uh, it's going to be wonderful. Okay. Now there's a, there's a flaw on that. It's a, and it's a key flaw, but it's not in an obvious spot. That's, that's the thing about the Jehovah. These guys are sneaky. You know what I mean? When they set up these, these false religions, they, they look for a niche in the religious marketplace that nobody has exploited before. Okay? You know, and uh, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is a really important point here. And again, this is generally speaking cadence so they have an idea of where they're going with it okay um, so talking here about um, okay we'll, we'll begin in verse 45 uh, so also it is written the first man Adam became a living soul now the last Adam became a life-giving spirit however the spiritual is not first but the natural then the spiritual now the first man Adam of course is from the earth, the second man, that's Jesus, is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy, and as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. And just as we bore in the image of the earthy, we will bear, also bear the image of the heavenly. Okay, now Adam in the Garden of Eden was a perfect man in a perfect world, right? One slight problem, he's earthy. Not, per not particularly spiritual. So the Garden of Eden is not biblically the place you want to go back to. Because you're just going to have an earth filled with earthy people. <laughs> okay, how's that going to work? Well, just like it did the first time. Okay, if, if Adam hadn't been earthy man, he wouldn't have fell. See, but he was, he was natural man. He was, um, you know, what you've heard me say it. His, his problem is he'd rather spend his time tend in the back 40 than he would walking with God. And so both he and, and Eve fell. And of course, God, Adam gets the blame for it, okay? Because through one man, sin entered the world. And uh, death through sin, spiritual death. And so all, all died because all sinned. Um, so 
the whole foundational premise for the Jehovah's Witnesses is wrong. You know, the goal is not to try to get back to a Garden of Eden. So you have to be careful with that. Lynn, were you with me in a study we had in Whitehall one time? I don't know, it was Teresa Chamberlain. Okay. I just, it was down in that area, so sometimes I thought you might have been with me. Anyhow, I was with Teresa Chamberlain in Whitehall. And so the Jehovah's Witness lady had been beaten on doors, and so she dropped in at this particular study. And uh, so, okay, so she starts out, and, you know, again, we're going to start with the fall, fr purposes frolicking in the happy sea. And I said, okay, see, so don't, that's, see, so I had to just cut her off right there at the foundational point. You agree with that foundational point, guess what? See, so I said, no, no. What do you mean? I mean, it was really nice. Well, yeah, the surroundings were really nice, but what about people? See, I mean, who, who messed up Eden? Saber-toothed tigers? Hyenas? You know, I mean, who, who messed up Eden? Well, it was bad. It was messed it up, see? So you bring earthy people into a Garden of Eden, what are you going to get? Same thing. So th that whole foundation is flawed. Now, a second major point then is who Jesus is. If you go to John chapter 1, if you have a New World translation, okay, this is how, this is how the New World, interesting. You see why it's called the New World? The New Garden of Eden. See, that, 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 they got their own translation. That's what's called the New World Translation. Okay? And uh, so in the beginning was the word. I'm going to read it the way. I'm, I'm doing this by memory from the uh, New World Translation. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was a God. Because in the Jehovah's Witness view... Jesus is a lesser creation of Jehovah. He's the first thing that Jehovah created. But he's a creator, a created being by Jehovah. That's why they're called Jehovah's Witnesses. See, and I want to pray to Jehovah. If you go to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1.15. See, and they're really good at pulling one-liners out that uh, make it sort of look like... <clears throat> and again, that's why you've got to have the Scripture in context as well as the total context, you know, of the New Testament and the Word of God. So Colossians 1.15, it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. See, Jesus is the first thing that Jehovah created. It says it right there. Right? So he's the firstborn. Okay? Now, side note, what does Colossians 1.15 mean? It means he has the title of the firstborn. He owns it. Th that's what that means. Because who is Jesus, really? Okay, and this is where... We're going to go back to Isaiah 6. We've been over this before. Yeah? Go ahead. I, I pulled that up, and it's really interesting. The very next verse, yeah. they say... Um, You're talking to the New World Translation yeah, here. Because by means of him, all other things were created. So they just play the game. Instead of by him, all things were created, all other things. So. Yeah. See, they, they're good at throwing these little ec extra words. Did you catch that difference? By him, all other things, see, are created. Instead of by him, all things. See, it just... Little words make big differences. And so, but again, they're clever. See. But uh, Isaiah chapter 6, now we've been over this before, but, you know, this is a good time to go over it again. Again, this is stuff you got to know, okay? You're out there, you don't think you're ever going to need this stuff, so, okay, Wilson, move on. You know, and then 
all of a sudden the Jehovah's Witness is over your house cleaning your plow. Okay, uh, should have probably paid more attention, right? How many have ever invited the Jehovah's Witnesses in for, for discussion? Yeah, okay. and then, you know, if you, again, if you don't know, they're, you're, they're pretty well trained. I mean, they have training sessions every week, you know, how to mesmerize your main, my, mind so that your mind is as mesmerized as theirs. So Isaiah 6.1 says, In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw the Lord. Now, again, you've got to remember, and this important in this discussion here, you've got to remember that that's Adonai. Okay? Which means Lord. It can be the Lord of the castle, uh, or it can be the Lord God. See, it's a general word. Okay? It's one of God's name. But um, somebody else can be a Lord. Okay? Adonai. Okay? So in the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw Adonai sitting on a throne, loft and exalted, the train of his robe filling the temple. And seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his feet, feet, face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Okay, so you'll notice that most of your versions have capital L, small capital O, small capital R, small capital D. And they do that to let you know that that is the tetragrammaton. Okay, tetragrammaton is a word that means four letters. Okay, notice it's easy to say four letters and it is tetragrammaton. Okay, but hey, if you're going to be intellectual, tetragrammaton, I mean, it just has gravitas to it, doesn't it? Tetragrammaton. Okay. But, you know, that's the, you know, what you sometimes bring into uh, English is YH, WH. Okay. Which we stick the letters A and E in there to make it Yahweh. Okay. Now, a lot of the early work, you know, that uh, was set in motion in the English translations was actually done by Germans. And so, in Germany, that came out Jehovah. Because in Germany, a J sounds like a Ja, and a V sounds like a W. Volkswagen, right? Jan instead of John, right? So this was, in German, you know, that would have been Yahweh. But when you put it this way, as you pronounce it with the English pronunciation, it comes out Jehovah. Okay? So the Jehovah's Witnesses, that's where they're going to get their name from. All right? Now, as long as we understand that Jehovah is the same as Yahweh, they're just different ways of pronouncing, pronouncing the tetragrammaton. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Uh, okay, we can use those interchangeably, know what we're talking about. Okay, somebody climbed on my case one time because it's Yahweh and not Jehovah. And I said, come on, you know. I, you know, I already explained, you know, yes, it's Yahweh, but... Sometimes Jehovah, okay? So since we're talking Jehovah's Witnesses, Dave, we use Jehovah, all right? So where that's all caps, holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts, okay? The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I, Isaiah, said, woe is me, I am ruined I am a man, because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips, lips, for my eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. Okay, so what you'll notice here, if you put these t verses 3 and 5 together, is that Isaiah saw the glory of Jehovah. Okay, pretty clear. All right, he saw, remember we're talking Jehovah Witness now, he saw the glory of Jehovah. And... Uh, and I'll, I'll comment on the New World Translation in a minute, okay? So then one of the seraphim, verse 6, flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he'd taken from the altar with tongs. 
He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the voice of Adonai saying, Notice that Adonai and Jehovah are the same here. The two different names for the same, all right? So I heard the voice of Adonai saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us, which is interesting. Then I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now you want to remember that quote there in verses 9 and 10. Okay. So we get to John chapter 12. Again, you know, for a lot of you it's review, but it's got a specific point to this review, different from the specific point of the last review. So John chapter 12, verse 36. John 12, 36. Jesus said, while you have the light, believe in the light so that you may become the sons of light. So remember, I'm going to stick pronouns. I'm going to stick the name in for the pronouns. Because you guys remember your English. If you have a pronoun, a pronoun has to have a, an antecedent, right? See, how many of you remember that from your English paces? How many remember that period? Jim, you remember that from your English paces? All right, Jim. And uh, see, so if I say the boy hit the ball and then somebody came and hit him, okay, him's referring back to the boy. Him's the pronoun, boy's the antecedent, okay? That's the way, and so every pronoun has to have antecedents. But this is a long section here, and you can get lost to who the antecedent is in the midst of the pronouns. So I'm going to stick the antecedent in, and the antecedent's going to be Jesus, all right? So these things, middle verse 36, these things Jesus spoke, and Jesus went away, and Jesus hid himself from them. But though Jesus had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in Jesus. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Side note, you notice it's capital Lord's here, but because in the New American Standard, but because it's a quotation from the Old Testament, it doesn't mean anything here. You have to go back to the Old Testament quotation, you know, to be sure you know what it's talking about. Okay, so verse 39, okay, the first quote's out of Isaiah 53. We're going to have two quotes here. For this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, he's blinded their eyes, he hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes, perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. Well, you recognize that's the quote out of Isaiah 6. So we have two here that John's referring to. And uh, so it says, these things Isaiah said because he saw Jesus' glory and he spoke of Jesus. See, by the time you get there, you can forget that that's talking about Jesus. So that's why we're sticking the antecedent in the place of the pronouns. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in Jesus, but because the Pharisees, they were not confessing Jesus for fear that they'd be put out of the synagogue for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. And that's the last time that ever happened. <laughs> so... The point here, there's two different places where Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. One of those is Isaiah 53.1, which says, the Lord is, in Isaiah 53.1, Jehovah. The other one that we just got through looking at in more detail, the glory that Isaiah sees is the glory of Jehovah, but it says here, it's Jesus' glory. So, if one's the glory of Jehovah and the other's the glory of Jesus, what's that tell you about Jesus? Uh, I guess he'd be Jehovah, right? <clears throat> so, I try to get the Jehovah's Witnesses to the point. I say, well, bring your, bring your New World Translation over here. Okay. See, because this is one they missed. In fact, let's go back to Isaiah, 50, uh, Isaiah 6 for just a second. And this will let you know that their poor scholarship on their, okay? So Isaiah 6. So I was, you know, at the Cascade County Detention Center on the outside of the glass and trying to talk to a guy on the inside of the glass. I always like to make that distinction. You know, I mean, someday I may be inside the glass. 
you know, but it won't because I be, because I stole somebody or murdered, or you know, <clears throat> ripped little old ladies off in the street. You know, it'll be because they find something, you know, that they can nail me with, and you guys will be subjected to a barrage of propaganda as to what a mean, vile individual I am. If that's what happens, just letting you know ahead of time. You've seen it already how it works. You know what they tried to do to Justice Kavanaugh, or what they did to Judge Roy Moore, <laughs> and. Uh, so they'll try to find something, and they'll, they'll try to find somebody that can say something about when you were 14 years old. Okay. Uh, but, you know, so I was outside the glass, and uh, there was a Jehovah's Witness guy. We were three chairs apart. You know, he was waiting to meet somebody, and neither of our, our guys had come in. I said, hey, you got your New World Translation? I mean, I could tell by looking, this guy's a Jehovah's Witness. And I said, uh, hey, you got your New World Translation with you? He said, well, yes. And I said, uh, hey, can I look at it for a second? Well, yeah. So I turned over here to Isaiah chapter 6 because I just wanted to refresh my memory. And I was pretty sure, but I just wanted to refresh my memory. So I refreshed my memory, so I know my memory is accurate here because it's been refreshed. <laughs> and uh, so it uh, does say, okay, in verse 3, holy, holy, holy is Jehovah's host. Verse 5, my eyes have seen the king, Jehovah's host. Okay, so you can use Isaiah 6 and John 12, and you can prove that Jesus is Jehovah. Now, these guys got so excited about sticking Jehovah in every place that um, verse 1 says, In the year of King Isaiah's death, I saw Jehovah sitting on the throne. And verse 8, I heard the voice of Jehovah saying, See, now what that tells me is the boys didn't really do scholarship. They just took some version, like maybe the King James Version or something, when it said, Lord, they just stuck Jehovah in there instead of Adonai. But the point is, the comparison of John 12 and Isaiah 6 will establish beyond any shadow of a doubt to any rational, honest person that Jesus is Jehovah. Now, if Jesus is Jehovah, guess what that does to the entire Jehovah's Witness belief system? Crumbles and scattered and gone. Okay? So... You know, sometimes, like I say, you have to say, well, hey, wait a minute, there's a problem here with you guys' overview. But as soon as you get the chance to address the conversation over, said, you know, who, I mean, who is Jesus really? Maybe we want to take a look at a couple things, if you don't mind. You know, and have, hey, get your New World Translation open. Let's, let's take a look at that. Okay? And you get to go to Isaiah 6, and you get to go to John 12, and guess what? Their own version proves that Jesus is Jehovah. See, God buried it deep enough that they missed it. They did some really obvious ones, you know, um, you know, to try to say that Jesus is different, like what we read out of Colossians there. But, see, when you get to a little bit deeper, they missed them. And now they don't get to go back and change their translations. I mean, 1917 was a year, folks, and, and uh, so they don't get to go back and, and uh, change those translations. And... Uh, so, take, you know, take a run with that and, and uh, ask, ask it in question form, Caden. Say, what, you know, you, you, do you ever bring your New World Translation with you? Oh, actually, you guys got it on your phone, probably. Yeah, New World. Same, hey, uh, got time, you know, maybe it's break time or something. Got time. So let's, let's look at that. I, you know, you, you use the New World Translation, too, see? And what are they going to do with it? See, and at that point, most people's brain just goes shut down. See, when people face something <clears throat> that totally <clears throat> uh, obviates their belief system, <clears throat> now their brain shuts down. And they are not interested in engaging in any further rational discussion. See, and that's why, let's go back to Isaiah 1. This is such an important verse here. Again, you guys will recognize it. It's foundational. Foundational. Isaiah 1.18, he says, Come now, let's reason together. Okay? Says the Lord, Though your sins are scarlet, they'll be white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, they'll be like wool. See, the scripture is a reasoned document. 
it, it, it's a reasoned presentation by God from beginning to end. When you get to the New Testament, for example, the presentation by the apostles in the book of Acts are reasoned presentation to an audience that they're trying to get to follow along with them. And your big problem is that emotion clouds reason. You know, it says in the book of Proverbs that, uh, and Ecclesiastes kind of makes the same point, different words, but basically um, a bribe blinds the eyes of the judge, okay? And um, see, in other words, people will follow the dollars or the special drawing rights or, you know, whatever the new currency is going to be. They'll follow that rather than truth because they, they start looking at it and they start calculating. So yesterday I grabbed Katie by the arm and we went between uh, Butte and Dillon, a place called Melrose. Melrose is in Madison County, have you know. And uh, it's right on the edge of Madison County, but it's in Madison County. And, and uh, right at Melrose, there's a creek that comes in from the east called Camp Creek. And you go up Camp Creek about three miles, and, uh, and I, did I, I did look at it. I did find, okay, it was just not as good example. <laughs> but <clears throat> there's spots there where their great unconformity is visible. Now, the great unconformity shows where the, the base granite rock or the gneiss or the schist that, you know, maybe got metamorphosized during the flood. And then sitting right on top of that is your first layer of sedimentary rock. In Montana, it's flathead sandstone. And flathead sandstone is the same as tapete sandstone in the Grand Canyon. Okay, small flood, small flood. <clears throat> See, the, the great unconformity is really important because supposedly there's a gap of one point, say, eight million years between the, the base rock and the sandstone that sits on top of it with no particular erosion in 1.8 billion, okay, or 1.2, or whatever number they put on it, okay? So, so I went there to look at that myself and to try to get some pictures, and I'm going to go back. I don't know if Katie's, I don't know if she's up to going back <laughs> again or not. I mean, you know, but, uh, you know, because some pretty rough roads and stuff, and it's one of the most easily accessible spots where you can see the, the, uh, the great unconformity. The thing is, the great unconformity is worldwide. It's worldwide. Now, how do you get worldwide, you know, with the first layer of sandstone that's got the first <coughs> primitive life, that is, and it's all sea, it's all sea marine animals. No sea marine plants, only sea marine animals. Animals. Yeah, the in the you know the sand the flathead sandstone is the base rock. Okay, that's where the first life, other than single cell bacteria and stromatolites, show up. First life. It's called the Cambrian explosion. Okay, now how you get an explosion with <laughs> evolution? That <laughs> nobody can really explain that one either, but. But it's all mammal, it's all animal life, not mammal, all animal life, marine animal. Why no plants? <clears throat> you know, the next layer's up. Marine animal, marine animal, marine animal. You don't, it's way up the chart, you know, hundreds of millions of years before you get the plants. Makes perfect sense, right? <clears throat> but, uh, See, again, I think they make a great point, you know, uh, the ICR guys and the Answers in Genesis guys, they make a great point. The rocks don't lie. So I was over checking out a place where the rocks don't lie. That's because, you know, I'm interested in establishing the truthfulness of the scripture. I mean, that's why I had to work through evolution creation myself, you know, had to work through all the geology, you know, eons long stuff, you know, because... If that's true, the Bible isn't. It comes down. And, you know, you don't get to pull the line. I tried to pull this. You don't get to pull the line <clears throat> that God used evolution to do it. Because you still got major problems, okay? So plants don't get created till day three, right? <clears throat> uh, sun doesn't get created till day four.
You suppose God did that deliberately? See, so you can't mess. There's no way you can mess the idea God did it uh, over long periods of time. You know, and that's your first. That's your first thought when you first start encountering this. Is okay. Well, maybe God did it by evolution. Nope, that doesn't work either. So anyhow, so there's a lot more than the great unconformity, but that one happens to fit in the rocks.